continue this time of joyful worship. The Old Testament reading is Habakkuk chapter 1, beginning with the first verse. The oracle of God, which Habakkuk the prophet saw. O Lord, how long shall I cry for help, and you will not hear? Or cry to you violence, and you will not save? Why do you make me see wrongs and look upon trouble? Destruction and violence are before me. Strife and contention arise. So the law is slacked, and justice never goes forth. For the wicked surround the righteous, so justice goes forth perverted. I will take my stand to watch and station myself on the tower, and look forth to see what he will say to me, and what I will answer concerning my complaint. And the Lord answered me, Write the vision, make it plain upon tablets, so he may run who reads it. For still the vision awaits its time. It hastens to the end, it will not lie. If it seems slow, wait for it. It will surely come, it will not delay. Behold, he whose soul is not upright in him shall fail, but the righteous shall live by his faith. This is the word of God for the people of God. Last weekend, uh, Lisa and I were uh, away uh, commemorating yet another birthday in my life. We went to West Virginia, which previously I had only driven through, but we have some uh, dear longtime friends who let us stay in their home at the Greenbrier. What a gift to us. That was lovely. And West Virginia is an absolutely beautiful state. It's really interesting. There's so much beauty there, but then you turn your head and you see heartbreaking poverty, and especially in the wake of the flooding right, a few weeks back, it's always that way, isn't it? Like, there, there, there's wonder and beauty, and it's right next to sorrow and struggle. It's always that way. One of the highlights of uh, being there is we went on this, some of you have done this, I'm sure, we went, there's a bunker tour at the Greenbrier. Now, back in the 50s, President Eisenhower thought there should be a place where Congress could be sequestered, right, where they could get away in case there was a nuclear attack on Washington. So they built in secret, you know, this, this underground up into the hill, this massive complex, and up into the 90s, they kept the thing you know, they, they staffed it secretly, and they, they kept food and medicine in there, and it's absolutely amazing. And our tour guide, he was absolutely charming and wonderful. To me, the most interesting thing that he said, though, he described all of this, and he said, but it's important to remember, nothing happened here. <laughs> nothing happened here. It was much ado about nothing. That struck me because today is Reformation Sunday. This is the 400, and tomorrow will be the 499th anniversary of Martin Luther nailing his theses to the Wittenberg door. What he was doing was that there was a church in those days. I mean, they built it, but, but nothing was really happening, or what was happening was corrupt. And he, he was nailing his theses to the door saying, yeah, God wants something to go on down here. And the question that we have to ask ourselves on a day like this, of each of us as individuals and of our church and of Christendom in general, is, 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 is anything going on? John, John Wesley, our founder as Methodist, once said this, I'm not afraid that the people called Methodists should ever cease to exist either in Europe or America, but I am afraid lest they should only exist as a dead sect having the form of religion without the power. I mean, we got the form of religion down, but do we have the power? Is anything happening here? Is anything happening in you? How would we know if something was going on? We could look to what arguably is the most important verse in the Bible. Most people would count that as being John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. That over the past century has been counted as kind of the most important verse in the Bible, but not before that. Through most of Christianity's history, the most important verse in the Bible is in the book of Habakkuk. And you may never have heard of Habakkuk. It's even a little hard to pronounce, isn't it? Habakkuk. Let's say it together. Habakkuk. Good job. <laughs> 
Habakkuk was the Habakkuk came along in the year 605 BC, and you couldn't think of a we th we think the world is troubled now. Oh my goodness! In 605 BC, the Assyrian Empire was crumbling, but it was being taken over by the even more evil Babylonian Empire. Israel briefly had a king Josiah that they hung their hopes on, and he was wonderful indeed. But then he died unexpectedly at age 39. <laughs> Thought of all the people in history who died at age 39 that we needed longer. I mean, Martin Luther King and Dietrich Bonhoeffer and Amelia Earhart and Flannery O'Connor, Frederick Chopin, 39. And during these days, God called the prophet Habakkuk to speak to the people who were totally desolate and forlorn. And, and what Habakkuk began by saying is, I will climb up on the watchtower and I will watch. I mean, it's tempting to quote Bob Dylan, right? He won the Nobel Prize. <laughs> All along the watchtower. Habakkuk climbs up on the watchtower. And, it, and what Habakkuk suggests is, is that the life of faith is, is, like, is like being a, a sentry on the watchtower and, and you scan the horizon for some sign of change, for some sign of hope. Roland Williams, who used to be the Archbishop of Canterbury, said that the life of faith is like bird watching. I have never personally bird watched. Is that a verb? Can we use that? I've never bird watched, but evidently if you go bird watching, you don't walk out in the woods and suddenly the birds all come and present themselves to you. Hi, I'm a cardinal. <laughs> what happens is you have to go out there and you have to get very still and you get some binoculars and you look carefully and you wait and you look for just any sign. Habakkuk is looking for some sign of God, for some small sign of goodness. This is what the life of faith is like according to the Bible, and, and you and I miss it every time. And you know why we miss it every time? It's because of something that happened in the second presidential debate. Uh, I saw something on the internet the other day that said, highlights of the debates. It, it, this should be called the lowlights of the debates. It, there's no high moment. There was one good moment, though, in the second debate, I'll just say, and it was right at the end. I don't know if you caught this. You may have just gotten ill by that time. But at the end of the second debate, a guy stood up and said to Hillary and Donald, could you two guys say something nice about one another? And I'll tell you why that's important. That was kind of a throwaway line, kind of a little levity, kind of, you know, lighten the mood. But the fact is, that's the question. Can, can we learn to see good? What we've gotten to be good at is finding fault. What we've gotten to be good at is complaining. What we've gotten to be good at is judging. What we've gotten, you see, we're just, we're just so, and, and what the life of faith is about isn't, isn't critique and, oh, I can find fault, and, oh, it's so dreadful, and, oh, it's, that's not the life of faith. The life of faith looks for any sign of good and celebrates that, and, in fact, that begins to be what, what consumes your attention instead of all the negative stuff. So the faith, faith stands on the watchtower and looks for just some sign of good. Some, maybe the, it's, it may be a hug. It may be a, a, br a breeze. It may be a leaf that's unusually beautiful. It may be a commitment that's kept. It may be another breath that you took. It may be the fact that you, you can close your eyes and be pretty sure God's listening to you and cares for you more than you care for yourself. We just look for any sign of good that God is moving and working. We had a funny thing that happened in that vein uh, recently. We're, our church is uh, part of a, a little project called the, the Pass the Peace Feast. That's hard to say, Pass the Peace Feast. It's a, a project that we're engaged in with St. Mark's United Methodist Church, which is largely African-American church here in Charlotte. And, and the scheme is what really needs to be going on all over the city to deal with what's going on. And that's that you put black people and white people and policemen together and then they eat together and they do it again the next month and they do it again the next month and they become friends and that's what needs to go on in the world so we actually had one of these uh, on October the 13th and it was teenagers so we had uh, white teenagers and black teenagers and policemen and they were eating in Napa right right around the corner you know the restaurant Napa this is not what you usually see in Napa right white, black teenagers, and police. So at the end of the meal, they get ready to pay the bill, and lo and behold, somebody has picked up the tab. Somebody saw it. Now, I am not a fan of random acts of kindness. That just so gets on my nerves. I'm in line at the Chick-fil-A, and somebody paid for my meal. I'm like, oh. <laughs> it, just, it just makes me cry. Help somebody that needs it. I can afford my sandwich. Anyway. But this, this was not a random act of kindness. 
right? Somebody's in Napa, and they saw something highly unusual. It's black teenagers, white teenagers, and policemen having dinner together. And I don't know who did that, but I bet they saw that and thought, that is good. That is what the world needs. It's a sign of God. God is moving. God is doing something. Habakkuk's verse became the most important verse in the history of Christianity. It's Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 4, and it's a short and simple one. The righteous shall live by faith. The righteous shall live by faith. Uh, that's really pretty simple. It was Paul's favorite, St. Augustine's favorite, Martin Luther's favorite, John Wesley's favorite. The righteous shall live by faith. And, and what we believe, this is, is there anything going on here? Is there anything going on in your life? Faith. Faith isn't when you scrunch up your face and you say, there is a God. There must be a God. I can't see God, but that's not what faith is. Faith is when you say, what is my life about? I, I, I put my life in God's hands. And in fact, that, that's almost silly to think about because God, God made me. I'm dependent on God for having made it this far and for existing at all. And so I just praise and thank God for all of it and say to God, whatever you want from me, of me, in me, I am, I am yours. I trust you. We believe in that stuff that, that Jesus gave his life so that we could be forgiven. Like he is our salvation. He is our hope. And we bank everything on that. And we say, I am all in. I am all in on that. See, faith isn't these other things. During the Protestant Reformation, one of the reasons that Luther got rankled and nailed those theses to the door is there was this guy, he was many of them, but the leader of them was this Roman Catholic guy named Johann Tetzel. And what he was doing is he had like the world's greatest fundraiser ever. Now, churches always have to raise funds. We're doing this now. Be generous. Help us out. But the way Tetzel was raising money was corrupt. See, we say give money because God's blessed you and God loves you and you just you, you love God back by doing this. What Tetzel said is that uh, if you want to avoid going to hell, and in fact, if you have dead relatives who you think might be in hell, if you give money, their souls will spring out of hell and go to heaven. I mean, what a, what a deal, right? And so he's raising money, and that money, by the way, goes to build St. Peter's Basilica in Rome that you may have visited. Isn't that amazing? The most beautiful architecture, corrupt fundraiser. There you go. The Tetzel deal, though, is this. It's that God is, a, is about an exchange. I do something for God, and therefore God saves me. And that may be, my goodness, I, I'm good, therefore God will save me. Or we'll say, oh, Bob, surely he's in heaven. If anybody deserves to go to heaven, it's Bob. We're Christians. We believe in the grace of God. You're saved not by the things that you do. You're saved because God loves you. You, you can't earn it. You can't deserve it. You can't run away from it. You can't get rid of it. God just loves you. It's all grace, which is wonderful. The other thing that faith is, actually three things that faith is. The second thing that faith is, and it's, it's not an emotion. Sometimes we think this thing like, I don't feel what I should feel. That's not what the life of faith is. It, the Bible doesn't say thou shalt feel a certain way about God. It says you, you put your life in God's hands. You trust God. You're going to trust your life with something. The third thing <laughs> that it's not is you also had this guy about the time named John Calvin. He's the founder of the Presbyterians. And when you think about John Calvin, just to our Presbyterians friends, we have to say, God, bless your heart. Bless your heart. <laughs> There's saddle forever with John Calvin. Because what John Calvin taught, we, we, we don't want to pay attention to this, but it's true. Calvin taught that you're, either, you're predestined to salvation or you aren't. You're predestined to salvation or you aren't. And John Wesley, the founder of the Methodist, said, that's nonsense. God made every one of us. God loves every one of us. God yearns for each one of us. God, God is literally dying to save each one of us. Habakkuk 2.4, pretty important. But it's interesting that Habakkuk 2.4 says the righteous shall live by faith. It still does use the word righteous. There's something in there about being righteous. The Verses just on the other side of Habakkuk 2.4, one, one says, the, the greedy do not endure. Well, that's a happy thought, right? And, and, and then there's this, he whose soul is not upright in him shall fail. <clears throat> I mean, there's something in this about something, ha but God, what God wants to do in us is something about having a soul that is upright. It's why I've been doing this series during the election, is that I think there's something wrong in the souls of people in America. We've got all this rancor and we're all tied up, but God wants us to be at peace. God wants us to be full of love. God wants us not to be fearful. God wants us not to be tied up in knots. God wants us to be holy. 
And when we're holy, we, we try to be God-like, but then, but then also that love that pours into us, pours out of us. Uh, my daughter Sarah, uh, she's a pastor up in Winston-Salem. She wrote a song that you're going to hear in a minute. My, my friend Cameron is going to come sing it for you as soon as I'm done. Uh, she wrote this song, I think it was after the Dallas police shootings, but you just never know them. And so many shootings, it was after one of them. It's just a blur after a while. Which, which shooting did she write the song after? It almost doesn't matter. The, the lyrics to her song are, are just something. She wrote, why can't, it's a prayer. Why can't you promise me freedom from suffering? Why not unbreak my heart? My Lord, if you bore all our sins, why not just bear them away? We pray for your kingdom come, thy will to be done. But prayer is not enough. We're good at singing songs from death. It's all around. On the one hand, what Sarah's song is about is it's pleading to God for help. It's a cry in the dark. But it also says, like, we got to do something. We have to do something. I'll close with this. The cool moment that happened at the Greenbrier, it is such a lovely place. We're having a great time. And one night we went to dinner, and you had to take a shuttle to get to this dinner location. So, so we got on the shuttle, and it was just us and this other couple. And this other couple, they were a little older even than I at my advanced age. And they seemed to be veterans of the Greenbrier. They knew a lot about it. And the bus, the, the shuttle drivers there, they, they know each other. And they're talking. And the, the buzz around the Greenbrier right now, it's interesting. They have five you know, world-class golf courses, and four of them were devastated by the flooding. So there are bulldozers out there, and everybody's very anxious. When are the golf courses going to be back online? That's a big concern. And so they're, they're talking to the driver about that, the golf courses. And, and the, and the, but then the conversation shifts because the, the, the shuttle driver says, well, do, do you know about the Village of Hope? And they said, you know, what? And they said, well, in, in White Sulphur Springs, which is a little town that's right there adjacent to the Greenbrier, where there's actually a lot of poverty. And a lot of the homes, this Howard's Creek overflowed its banks. There were house, a lot of houses were just wiped out. I mean, poor people, and they lose everything in a flood. Well, there's this housing project called the Village of Hope. Lisa and I went to visit it. It was wonderful. And they're building all these homes there. So, so the Greenbrier guy is asking the bus driver, he's saying, now, now how, who pays for that? How, that? That's always the kind of question we love to have. Who pays for that? And he said, well, it's this consortium of this drug company and some, some other business, I forget. And, and he said, well, what, what about what's the construction crew? And he said, well, the, the work's being done by Mennonites. <laughs> this is amazing. And the guy says to him, who are the Mennonites? I started to intervene, and he said, well, they're, they're the people who've come to do the work on the houses. And he said, how much money are they making out of this? And I love the, the driver's response. He said, they're religious people. He said, they do it out of the goodness of their hearts. My brothers and sisters, is anything going on here? We're religious people. God's poured God's love into our hearts. What do, we, what do we do then out of the goodness of our hearts? Habakkuk challenges us to look for every sign, any small sign of God's movement, of God's mercy, of God's beauty. And then we say, I'm all in on that. I'm all in on that. There's so much love now in my heart. It's, it's going to overflow. I'm going to, we're going to do what religious people do. And then we'll have the power of the church and not just its form. Thanks be to God. Can't you promise me freedom from suffering? Why not unbreak my heart? Yes, resurrection's fine, but first I have to die. Why can't we skip that part? And oh, my Lord, if you bore all our sins, why not just bear them away? Oh, my Lord, if it's healing that's 
she'll bring you send a little more our way Send a little more our way. 